just a moment. As you're turning to Ephesians chapter 6, let me just mention to you that we have kicked off our Wednesday night Ignite classes. Um, this past Wednesday night, we just had a fun night. We baptized 12 people. We did food. We did games. It was just a chance for everybody after being dispersed throughout the summer to come back together, have fun, uh, build relationship. And now this Wednesday night, we start the actual classes. So there are a number of different electives. Uh, they are listed in the brochure. You should have received our new fall brochure uh, when you came into the sanctuary this morning. So you can look on Wednesday night. It says Ignite, and there's a list of classes uh, that are going to be available for those of you that want to come on Wednesday night. So just want to put in a plug for that and let you know about that. Story is told, true story, of a missionary who was serving in the nation of Africa. He'd been there a number of years. And the village that he was serving in was way up in the jungle, uh, in a very mountainous region. And so every once in a while, he would have to make the trek from the jungle mountains down into the city where he could get medical supplies for the people that he was helping in that village. Now, here was the thing. He was so far up in the jungle that it took him two days to make this trip. What that meant was, one of the nights during his trip, he had to stay all alone in the jungle. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem fun to me. I'm not doing a night alone in the jungle, sorry. Maybe a night alone in the Hilton, but not the jungle. But anyway, that's what he had to do every three or four months or so. Well, he was coming to the city on one of those trips. When he got near the city, he saw that this young man was being beaten up. I mean, he was being beaten severely by some other youths. And so he quickly moved into action and he saved the young man. He chased off the other two kids and here was this young man lying on the ground and he was bloodied and beaten and all that. And the young man looks up at him and he says, I know who you are. He said, my friends and I followed you into the jungle the last time that you came to town. He said, you don't know this, but we knew that you were carrying money and medicine. So we followed you into the jungle because we knew that you would have to stay a night alone and we planned on robbing you while you were asleep. But that night when we approached your campsite, we saw 26 armed guards surrounding you. And realizing that there were only six of us, we ran away in fear. The missionary looked at the young man and he just laughed. I mean, he just broke out laughing. He said, son, he said, that's impossible. I was absolutely alone on this trip. But the young man insisted. He said, I wasn't the only one. All of my friends saw 26 bodyguards. Several months later, that missionary returned to the States and he was preaching in a church. And he told that story. And by the time he got to the end of that story, a man in the congregation jumped up. And he recounted to the missionary that on that very day, that morning, the Lord had prompted him to gather men together to pray for this missionary. The man said, that day, I was able to get 26 men to come together and pray for you. Absolutely true story. Friends, we can do all the things that we've talked about in this series. But if we don't pray, we will lose the war. If you don't pray, you'll lose the war. Because prayer is the missing ingredient in most individuals and in most churches. In fact, if you're at Ephesians chapter 6, I want you to look at verse 18. Look at what Paul says. Remember, he's been talking about the armor of God. He's been talking about fighting this invisible war. And in verse 18, he wraps it all up by saying this. He says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers. Pray for believers everywhere. And then he says, look at pray for me. Ask that God would give me the right word so that I can boldly explain the mystery, mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. And then in verse 20, Paul says, I am in chains now. In other words, I'm bound. But I'm still preaching this message as God's ambassador, even with chains on. So pray for me that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. 
Now, I want to point out something to you this morning that you wouldn't necessarily know. We left off, left off last week at verse 17 where it says, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Unfortunately, the biblical translators, the people who put chapters and verses in the Bible, they decided that they were going to start a new verse at the end of that phrase where it says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In reality, verse 17 should be combined with verse 18 into one thought. In other words, here is what Paul was actually saying in the Greek. The sword of the Spirit is actually a combination of the Word of God mixed with prayer. In other words, the two have to be connected to get power. It's an unfortunate break in the text there. So what we tend to think is that the sword of the Spirit is just the word. But what Paul is really saying is your sword is a combination of both word and prayer. You've got to have both things in play. So I want to end this series today by talking about two things that we need to win this invisible war. The first one is I want to talk about the role of prayer. And secondly, I want to talk about the role of deliverance. Let's talk about prayer for a moment. So in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29, Jesus makes a direct connection between prayer and spiritual warfare. The disciples had spent the day trying to cast a demon out of a possessed boy. And after all of their trying, they failed. They couldn't do it. And when they get back together with Jesus to do a debrief, Jesus says to them these words. He says, don't you know that this kind can only be cast out through prayer? In other words, the disciples' theology was right, but their prayer life was lacking. I think that sometimes describes those of us in the church. Our doctrine, our theology is right. We've got that all right in the right places. We understand our theology, but the piece that's missing is our prayer lives. And I want to go back to what I said a moment ago. You can't win the war without what? Prayer. Because prayer gives theology power. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus tells Peter one day, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I want you to know something. Don't worry about it, because I have prayed for you. How cool is that? If Jesus were to come to you today and say, hey, don't worry about anything in your life. Don't worry about the attacks of the enemy, because I have been praying for you that your faith will not fail. You said, yeah, that'd be cool if Jesus would say that to me. He did say that to you in the scripture. The scripture says, he forever intercedes for you. Jesus is doing that. He is praying for you. Here's my point. Jesus was demonstrating to the disciples that prayer was the key to seeing people delivered from demonic influence and attack. The early church knew the power of prayer. That's why Acts 1.14, Acts 2.42 says, they continually they devoted themselves to what? Prayer. Why do they continually devote themselves to prayer? Because power falls where prayer prevails. Power falls where prayer prevails. So a New Testament church is not a church that has a few prayer meetings, but a New Testament church was one in which the people corporately came together to seek God and pray as a whole. So we have made a decision around here at Living Water that every Wednesday night from 7.30 to 8.30 here in this building, we are going to have a corporate prayer meeting. So those people that say, you know what, I like the Ignite classes, but none of them floats my boat, then come join us on Wednesday night so that we can pray together as the body of Christ. Because a praying church is a powerful church. Victory doesn't happen because we pray a little bit here and a little bit there when we feel like it. The Bible indicates that there is a specific kind of praying that produces miracles and deliverance. How many of you want to see deliverance and miracles happen in your life? Every one of us. So I'm going to tell you how that happens this morning. There is a specific way to pray to do that. 
And here's what Paul says in these verses that we just read. Number one, the kind of prayer that brings supernatural results is characterized by consistency. In other words, it's not haphazard. Paul says, pray at all times. He doesn't say pray sometimes. He said, pray continually, which means pray consistently. Don't stop praying. Some of us, we pray for a season because we have a problem, and then when the problem gets fixed or God answers that prayer, we stop praying until we have another problem. Paul says pray consistently. Why? Because the Holy Spirit responds and flows through consistent prayer. A little prayer in your life, in my life, it's not going to cut it. Our prayers need to be focused, consistent. Second, prayer that brings supernatural results is intense prayer. What do I mean by that? Paul tells the Ephesians in the text that we just read that they were to be on the alert. Literally, in the Greek, it means to go without sleep. Right? So intense prayer means focused prayer, alert prayer, persevering prayer. See, every one of us in this room understands something. Prayer is hard. Why is prayer hard? Because the devil does everything he can do to distract us and cause us not to pray. Because he understands the power of prayer more than we understand the power of prayer this morning. He does everything he can to distract us. Prayer is hard for a reason. You want to know the reason? Because it works. It works. If we only pray when we feel like it, guess what? We're never going to pray. Can I make an admission? There are days I don't feel like praying. And I'm your pastor. Maybe I shouldn't say that. There are times I get up, I'm like, I don't feel like praying today. But we do it anyway. Intensity in prayer means this. We're not just going through motions. We're focused, we're alert, we're attentive, and we're persistent. Third, prayer that brings supernatural results is strategic prayer. Paul was very specific about what he wanted the Ephesians to pray for. And if we want to win this invisible war that we've been in, we need to pray targeted, specifically targeted prayers. Because when we pray vague prayers, it's hard to ever know whether a vague prayer is answered. Right? And vague prayers generally do not make an impact. So the more specific you are in your prayers, the more powerful the result will be and the more glory that God will get. So the early believers, when you thumb through the book of Acts, they prayed specific, bold, big, strategic prayers. And then we need to understand that prayer is more powerful than we can ever imagine. And that's why the enemy wants to keep us from praying. All right? That's the role of prayer in winning this invisible war. Now let's turn our attention to the second thing I want to talk about for the rest of our time this morning. And that's the importance of deliverance. In this series, we've talked about how to protect ourselves from the subtle attacks of the enemy where he tries to sneak in the back door, create havoc in our lives. And then last week, I talked about how to protect ourselves against very overt attacks from the enemy. What do you do when the enemy just like gets right in your face? I mean, he is right there and you know it. And we talked about that. So both of those things were all about how to keep the enemy out. But here is the question I thought about. What happens if the enemy has already gained a foothold in your life? What happens if before you got the shield up, he found a way to get in? What do you do then? Does anybody know? All right. I am going to go for the shameless plug today. So... What do you do if the enemy gets past the gates and you find that he's developed a stronghold in your life? You deal with it. All right? You learn how to deal with it. You can't teach on spiritual warfare without talking about the issue of deliverance. Because deliverance is, in my estimation, where the real battle lies in this war that we're waging. Now, let me talk for a moment about deliverance. Deliverance is a very controversial issue for a couple of reasons. It's controversial because of some of the abuses and the sensationalism that surrounded it, especially in the 1960s and the early to mid-1970s. I mean, there were pre people that were doing some pretty, pretty crazy stuff 
calling it deliverance, and it wasn't biblical. But what we need to understand this morning as Christians is that deliverance is biblical, and it was a part of Jesus' ministry, and it was a part of the ministry of the early church. But what I want you to understand as you look at the gospel records, as you look at Jesus' life, is that Jesus never made a big deal about setting people free, about deliverance. What do I mean by that? He didn't run around and yell and scream at demons. He didn't bring buckets with him so that people could spit demons up in buckets and all that crazy stuff. He didn't draw attention to the process because he never wanted to bring glory to the enemy. He calmly, look it up folks, read every story where Jesus cast out a demon. He calmly commanded the demons to leave people. There was no fanfare, there was no fuss. He didn't need it because he had all power and authority. And he's given all that power and authority to you and I. We don't have to scream at people. We don't have to get engaged in, in a shouting match with the demonic. Friends, you've been given the power and the authority of God's Spirit to simply say, go. Go. So when you read the stories of Jesus, it was so unlike a lot of that stuff that has gone on around this whole business of deliverance. Jesus simply, even the demoniac who for decades had chained himself to a rock because he was so violent and he didn't have any clothes on him, he clawed himself and it was horrible. When Jesus meets that man, what does Jesus do? He simply says, loose that man. Be free. Go. That's it. He didn't do a big dance. There were no fireworks. He didn't call everybody in town to come see and say, now look at what I'm going to do. He just said, go. I love that about Jesus. Now, there are two kinds of demonic infiltration that can occur in a person's life. The first one is the sensational portion of this, and that's demonic possession. All right? Lots of movies have been made about it. Hollywood loves this stuff. Let me say this. We do not believe that Christians can be demon-possessed. Why? Because Satan cannot possess what belongs to God. End of story. Right? So if you ever hear someone talk about Christians being demon-possessed, that's not biblical. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. But remember, I said there are two ways that demonic influence can infiltrate your life. Demon possession is one of them when people give themselves over to the devil and they become possessed because they do that willingly or un, uh, because they get involved in different stuff. But the second way is through demonic influence, oppression, and strongholds. So when you read your Bible, the Bible really never uses the term possession. Instead, the Bible uses this term for the umbrella of demonic activity. It's called demonization. And I want you to think of that word demonization on a scale, a continuum, okay? One side to the other. And on one extreme is complete possession. And on the other side, there is demonic influence in someone's life, demonic oppression, and demonic strongholds. And they occur because a door has been opened to the enemy somewhere in that area of that person's life. And what we're going to do for the next few moments is we're going to focus on how do you defeat demonic strongholds, influence, and oppression in your life. Because here's the thing that you may not know. Every one of us has strongholds that we need to tear down in our life with the help of the Holy Spirit. All of us have created open doors where the enemy has gotten in, and the Bible says he has laid hold, he's gotten a foothold in our life somewhere. And so we belong to Jesus, but he's an unwanted tenant, and we've got to identify that stronghold, and we've got to kick him out, all right? We've got to cut off that influence. Again, it's not possession. It has nothing to do with that. We're not talking about today. Get that out of your mind. It's demonic influence in our lives. It's an area of our lives where the enemy has a stronghold. He has influence over us. Now, I'm going to say this. I can't cover everything today. We are going to fly at 35,000 feet. So I'm going to do just enough to open this can of worms for you. And then you're going to be left going home with, but I have questions. Well, guess what? On Wednesday night, we start a class. It's the deal with it class. And so if you want to get those questions answered, if you want to deal with some of the stuff in your life, some of the 
things that are going on, the issues of your life. Look, at we've seen over a thousand people go through the deal with the class over the last 14 years. And I would just encourage you, sign up. There's a table in the atrium. Get into this class, and you will learn how to deal with all this stuff in detail that I'm just going to kind of skim over today, all right? So here's the place we're going to start. We're going to start by understanding how do demonic influences and strongholds form. And the first way that people open themselves up to demonic influence is by engaging in activities like horoscopes, palm reading, Ouija boards, witchcraft, tarot cards, astrology, spell casting, seances, and other such activities. Now, a lot of people think that those things are very harmless and they're very innocent. They play with Ouija boards and they say, well, it's nothing more than a game. They pick up the paper, they look at their horoscopes. But what you need to understand that in the spiritual realm, those activities have their roots in the demonic. Okay? So you want to stay away from those things because they simply open your life to demonic influence. I don't know about you, but I'm looking to close the doors, not open them. You say, well, where is that biblically, Pastor? Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. It says, do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out or anything like it. And so make yourself, and so by making yourselves unclean. Second, you open yourself to demonic influence and strongholds through what you watch and listen to. Some of you aren't going to like the next 30 seconds. By what you watch and listen to. Look at dark music and dark movies will open your spirit to demonic oppression and influence. And all I can say to you this morning is stop filling your mind with slasher movies and demonic horror movies and music where the lyrics are ungodly and they're dark and they talk about suicide. Don't fill your mind with that stuff. Okay, you say, but I like watching Saw 52. All right, you may like it, but stop watching Saw 52 because it's horrible. It's opening the door for the enemy, okay? Third, I want you to know that sin opens the door to the demonic. What do I mean by that? When we allow known sin to remain in our lives, we open the door to the enemy. Because when we refuse to deal with some issue, sinful issue that we know about in our lives, what happens is that issue begins to enslave us and demonic forces are able to oppress us then, okay? They get in the driver's seat of our life. So if you have known sin, you want to walk away from that. Fourth, spiritual rebellion opens the door for the demonic. 1 Samuel 15, 23 equates rebellion to witchcraft when it says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Let me give you an example of this. If I know what God wants me to do, but I do what I want to do anyway, it opens the door for demonic activity in my life. Why? Because I'm in rebellion. Because I know God wants me to go this way, and I've decided, you know what, God? I'm not doing your thing. I'm going to do my thing. Remember in week one, we talked about the spirit of deception. How can people do things and not know it's wrong? How can they do things and rationalize it? Here is the answer. Because when you walk away from God's way to do your own thing, you open the door up for demonic influence and the spirit of deception to take over your mind so that you begin to call evil good and good evil. That's what's happened in our nation today. Fifth, the most common cause of demonic influence is this. Unresolved anger and bitterness. See, most Christians are doing a pretty good job of staying away from the first four things that we've talked about. But where we fall down, where we open the door to the enemy, is because we have anger and bitterness issues that invite demonic activity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27 clearly states this. Anger gives the devil a foothold in our lives. That's what it says. So what can you do to break demonic strongholds and evict demonic influence from your life? Close the door to further entry so you can live in freedom. Let me give you the steps this morning. Step number one is you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because look at without his power, without inviting him into your life, without 
him getting rid of all the rocks in your life through forgiveness, you don't have a chance against the enemy. Those strongholds are going to stay there because you have no way to combat them. So number one, if you've never given your life to Christ, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sin, that's step number one. Step number two is this. We've got to repent of known sin in our life. When we do that, the enemy gets evicted from our lives and the door gets closed. So what is it that's controlling your life? When you allow sin into your life knowingly, what you're actually doing is you're giving Satan legal ground, legal deed to your life and your family. Look at I don't know about you, but I got enough problems without giving the enemy legal ground in my life. I'm trying to keep him out of my life, right? Now, when I say known sin, here's what our minds go to, most people. Here's how we judge whether there's known sin in our life. We think Ten Commandments. I'm doing all the Ten Commandments. I'm good. Well, that's wonderful. Good for you. But we need to broaden our definition of sin a little bit. Because sin is not only, uh, you know, about the Ten Commandments. Sin is all of the things that God has asked us to do that we're not doing, that we're ignoring. Let me give you two examples this morning of things that we don't categorize necessarily under sin, but God does. The first one is, have you forgiven people that have hurt you in your life? You see, when we don't forgive people, when we're unwilling to forgive people for the things that they've done to us, that's sinful. Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, I can't forgive you. But see, we don't tend to equate unforgiveness with sin because our definition of sin isn't broad enough. But if you are not forgiving others, if you are carrying unforgiveness and harboring bitterness against people, I can tell you something. The door is wide open in your life for the enemy to have his way. And then the second example I'll give you is another thing that we don't tend to think about. I was reading some statistics uh, recently, and I came across this shocking one. And it said this, that right now in America, only 4% of American Christians tithe, give to God. I, I looked at that, I was stunned by that. A few years ago, it was like 14%. And now we're down to 4%. That means that 96% of American Christians are not obeying the Word of God. Hmm. Disobedience is what? Sin. Sin does what? It opens the door for the enemy to wreak havoc in our lives. I know, you're not, I know you don't like this. But you know what? You got to tell it the way it is. So I was thinking about this and I thought, mm, most Christians are more committed to giving a 15 or 20 percent tip to the wait staff than they are giving their 10 percent to God. I thought that's not right. And then I started to think, I wonder, when was the last time you finished a meal in a nice restaurant and you said, man, the meal, fabulous, service, unbelievable. And then you got up and you blew off the tip. You just left. Or worse yet, you just left a dollar for the server. You know, the meal was like 120 bucks and you left a buck. By the way, if you do that, please make sure they don't know you're from Living Water Community Church. <laughs> or that you're a believer. Because we ought not to be doing that. But we ought not to be doing that to God either, right? The point is simply this, that we need to understand that disobedience in all its forms creates an open door for legal ground of the enemy. Step three, renounce the works of the devil. As if you realize that you've been involved in something that you shouldn't, or you've been believing a lie from the enemy, just renounce it. Turn your back on it. Make a clean break with any activity or belief system that has to do with the enemy. If you've involved yourself at some point in your life with seances or astrology or horoscopes or tarot cards or masonry or occult practices, just renounce it. Just renounce it. Okay? Now, those of you that weren't sleeping, your ears might have perked up when I said masonry. I'm not going to explain it to you today. You can take the class and find out more about it. But 
There are a whole lot of stuff that most people, the average person, doesn't know about masonry, where it comes from, and the roots of masonry. It's something you want to stay away from. Step four, destroy any occultic objects that you possess. Ouija boards. You know, some people have Ouija boards in their closet. Tarot cards, books on witchcraft, certain music and movies. Here's one people don't realize. They go overseas, uh, many times to third world countries, and they bring back masks or statues. And what they don't realize is that they're idols. And they bring them into their home. You can do that, but you need to pray over those things first. You need to cleanse those things. My suggestion is don't bring them back at all, but if you have them, there's, there's a way that you can do that. But all I'm saying is many times people buy souvenirs without realizing that there are spirits attached to those souvenirs um, because they're actually idols. You might want to get rid of some of that stuff. Fifth, break unholy friendships. In other words, break ties with people that keep dragging you into the pit and who influence you in bad ways. Now look, at, as believers, we are, we've been teaching you, we want to have relationships with unbelievers, right? We're to be salt and light. Salt doesn't do any good unless it gets on your food, right? It's got to be on the food. So the church, our influence is no good in here. It's only impactful if we take it out there and it gets on people, right? But what I'm talking about here in this point is if you're in relationship with people where they influence you more than you influence them, probably time to sever that relationship, okay? Sixth, fill your life with Jesus. Jesus tells the interesting story in Luke 11, 26, and he warns the people that are listening to his teaching after he sets someone free from demonic influence. He says, now look it, you've got to fill the house with something when the strong man is kicked out. Because if you leave an empty house, how many of you know science says that nature abhors a vacuum? Something else will fill it. And he says, if you don't fill it with spiritual things, if we don't fill our lives with Jesus, we don't fill our lives with the Word of God, we can get cleaned up, we can evict all of those influences in our life, we can break all those strongholds, but they'll come back, Jesus said, seven times worse if we don't fill ourselves with the right stuff. So we want to do that. And then seventh and finally, find a prayer partner if you want to break free of these things. We were meant, we were never meant to fight alone or to live alone. God created mankind for community. We need each other to be victorious in this life. Amen? And we have to realize that because some of us are like the Lone Rangers and we're trying to do this thing by ourselves and we're getting hammered. Get smart. Understand God created you for community. You can't reach your destiny by yourself. You can't be free by yourself. You can't be successful in life by yourself. All this garbage of business people who say, I was a self-made man. Baloney. Someone helped you to get to the top. There is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. We need each other because that's the way God designed it. And so last month when I was at my doctoral intensive for 11 days, um, I learned this lesson in a powerful way because we came to the end of our 11 days and our cohort wanted to go out and have a nice dinner together uh, before we all left the next day and just kind of celebrate the week and so forth and so on. And as we are walking out the door, one of the cohort members talks about they heard that we had to take a statistics class. Now, I checked this doctorate out because I can't do math. I can't pass it to statistics class. So I had to find a doctoral program that did not have a statistics course required. I looked at all the literature, all the stuff, no statistics. I said, that's not true. That's a lie from the devil. I rebuke that. <laughs> We do not have to take that ungodly, horrible class. <laughs> so on the way over, one of my classmates texts a professor and says, is this true? The professor says, yeah, we call it research technology. <laughs> Let me tell you, you want to talk about someone who's upset. I'm like, call sin, sin. It's not research technology, it's statistics. And so, by the time we get to the restaurant, I am, I'm literally in full panic attack mode because it's costing a lot of money to go through this program, and I just blew a lot of money if I've got to take a class that I know there is no way on this green earth that I can pass. 
And you may say, oh, Pastor, you're exaggerating. No, I can't pass it. That's the reality of it. Um, and so we get to the restaurant, we're all around the table. And at this point, I have my head on the table. I'm sweating profusely. I'm pretty much in a full-blown panic attack, and there are literally tears in my eyes. I mean, I am as upset as you can imagine. Because, you know, when you put this much work into something, you've been staying up every night till 1 in the morning doing papers and all this stuff. This is not a good time to find out information you should have known before you started. And so my classmates see that I'm visibly upset. The smartest guy in the class, his name is Adam. Pray for Adam. Adam is a great guy. Adam is Jewish. In the first day of the class, he declared to everybody, because we're at Olivet Nazarene, he said, hey, just want you to know I'm here for the learning, not for Jesus. Just like the degree program, and that's cool. But Adam and I were able to have numerous conversations during the week. Wonderful guy. Adam gets up from across the table. At this point, I have my head on the table. And he grabs me by the shoulders, and he lifts me up. And he gets in my face, and he says, you will not fail because I will not allow you to fail. He said, statistics are my thing. I am great at statistics. I will tutor you. I will come to your house. I will help you. I will do whatever it takes, but we are not leaving anyone behind. I guarantee you, you will not fail this class because I've got your back because you, I'm going to help you. And he looked right in the eyes. He said, do you understand me? You will not fail. It will not be allowed. And I'm just, I'm standing there, there's tears in my eyes, you know, after 11 days of being in class from 8 in the morning till 9 at night, you're, you're just emotionally wrecked anyway. And then God spoke to me. And God said, this is why I set people in community. See, there were some things during that week that I'd helped them with because they didn't know how to do it. And God said, now you're going to receive and they're going to help you to get through this class. Do you understand? You can't do this doctorate by yourself. You need others. And you can't be successful in the Christian life without the help of others. Because you see, we all do things well, and we all do things poorly, and that's why you need someone to come alongside of you in that moment and to pick you up and say, no man, no woman left behind. You will not fail. I'm going to help you to get through this struggle. I'm going to help you to get this victory. The reason that Crystal and I have been able to endure here for so many years, I want to tell you the secret, is because we have a group of people in this church that pray and intercede for us and have our backs and have gotten us through things we didn't think we could get through. That's what you need in your life to win this invisible war. It's about prayer. Consistent, intense, strategic prayer. And it's about ruthlessly dealing with any strongholds, any issues, any stuff in our life that's operating there and saying, you know what, enemy? You have no place in my life. I'm going to, you're out. You're out of here. I'm dealing with this. I'm not living with this any longer. And you do it together. We do it together as a family. That's how we win. That's how we win the war. That's how we're going to win this community together as a family. Remember that. Jesus, thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you've been teaching us over the last five weeks. And I just ask that right now, Lord, that this will be a watershed moment for many people, that, Lord, you will break chains, you will set people free, that what we've heard this morning will be applied to our lives so that we can fulfill the destiny that is on our lives. God, you created us for destiny. You created us for purpose, for greatness. And yet there are things that hold us back, whether it's the lack of prayer in our lives or whether it's issues that we struggle with. But Lord, you have given us a clear pathway to victory, clear steps that we've articulated today. So Jesus, I just ask you to help us. Would you stand this morning as we close? And if I could just have the ministry team very quickly come and get in place with no one moving for just a moment this is what I'd like to do as members of ministry team come if you're here this morning 
and you're just struggling with something in your life. There's an issue in your life. There's a stronghold in your life. It doesn't matter what it is. This morning, I believe that as we pray for people, these folks that are here all trained, as they pray for you, that the Holy Spirit is going to break those chains. It's going to set you free. You know, there are times in our life it takes a little bit more than that. It, it's a process. But there are moments of grace where God just speaks. And it happens just like that. The chains drop. They break. We walk away free. Maybe something that I said this morning hit you. Maybe, you know, you have some stuff lying around your house from a time when you weren't even a believer. Or you were involved in some stuff, and but now you're a believer. But you didn't even know to go back and just say, I renounce that stuff. I break that stuff in the name of Jesus. Any affiliation with whatever the Spirit is speaking to you about. Maybe there's other struggles, but you just know that, that you need freedom in some area of your life. I, I invite you this morning as I say a closing prayer to just come and receive prayer. The team is going to, Leon's going to sing over you a little bit. And when I'm done praying and we dismiss everybody, just kind of go out quietly today so that those that are receiving ministry they can come, they can receive it, and we just maintain the atmosphere that the Holy Spirit has set in this place. And I'm telling you, God wants to set people free today. He can do it like that. Just like that. He doesn't need a whole bunch of stuff. There might be weird stuff going on in your family. We've been talking for five weeks about the attacks of the enemy. I'm telling you, God, through the power of His Holy Spirit, can break that stuff. And He can turn things around in a moment. In a moment. I've seen Him do it. I've seen Him do it for years. So let me pray for you, and then if you need prayer this morning, the altars are open to come. Father, thank you for what we've learned in this series. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And Jesus, I just speak blessing and life over your people. I just say, Lord, set every person free this morning in this room. God, help us to be aware of closing those doors and walking in freedom. Jesus, we ask you to help. Lord, Build our connection to each other stronger so that we can help each other along the path. Lord, just come. Just come and bless your people as they go today and make them a blessing in this community. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the great morning that we've had together. We bless your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you as you go today. Have a great week. Showers of mercy.